let's pray now. We'll pray and we'll keep going. So the Lord be with you. Let's pray together. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of this world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, well, this Rector's Forum uh, took a little bit of a, uh, like I said before, um, it, 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 uh, well, we'll see how it works out. But I wanted to get this in front of you, this, the, the profundity of this prologue to God, John's Gospel, because the significance of the Incarnation I mean, when you talk about these things, there's a reason why the Orthodox sing almost everything they do when they talk about God, because you start realizing that our words are, 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 don't really do justice when you say something like the significance of the Incarnation, right? I mean, you want to fall to your face and worship. So forgive me, Lord. At any rate, um, the significance of the Incarnation has been um, not only forgotten, but is actively being undermined by the sort of current, sort of our current cultural uh, situation that we have been asked to live in. And what I mean by that in particularly is that the dignity, the human dignity that it confers upon each and every person, man, woman, and child ever born, the incarnation secures, is being threatened and outright attacked because of the rejection of the Christian faith. This is what we're, we're seeing, is that there is a, there is a, um, there is a, uh, the, 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 the connection between the incarnation and the Christian understanding of the dignity and worth of every single human being is inextricably linked. And when we lose one, we lose the other. If you go into life saying that, well, you know, some lives are worth, worth more than others, you know, then you will lose your Christian faith eventually. You know, you'll begin on a road um, if quality of life or whatever the euphemisms may be. And if you aren't a Christian, well, then you will have some conception, perhaps, of human dignity, but it will not be as deep and constitutive of your entire understanding of the world and of reality itself um, like you would and we do as Christians because of the Incarnation. That's the significance. And so we're going to look at a little bit of history about uh, how the significance, of the, how the Incarnation has um, affected both our culture and its rejection also um, has consequences itself. Okay, so um, this is just a reminder. You know, we don't get too heavy too fast, but this is how people come to church. You know, you're wondering about that person that you wish were here that aren't. Well, this is how you get them there. You um, invite them. You know, you tell them you're going to buy them lunch, right? That's always a good one. There's an all-you-can-eat sushi place. Has anyone gone to the all-you-can-eat sushi place on the corner? Anyone? Somebody needs to go before I go because I don't want to go and waste money. But I, I, maybe we'll take a collection and I'll go be the, the taste, the taste uh, um, tester there. Um, but this is why people come. Now, we do our best to make sure that when they get here, they have got something that is, uh, you know, that we have put our best foot forward. You know, we work very hard and, and we're always, you know, um, Monday morning quarterbacking the service. You know, what went well, what didn't well, was it too hot, too cold, were the lights on, or they were all the stuff. Um, so that's on us if when you get them here, they don't come back to a certain degree, although it's obviously the Holy Spirit. But, um, but your role in this is the, is the ask, as it were. You're front of the house. You know, you're the person that, that puts it out there. So people bring people. All right, well, 2024, um, we're looking ahead to that. And just as I mentioned last time, one of the things that is going to be uh, a topic of heated discussion is going to be this concept of quote-unquote Christian nationalism. And as I said before, I want to say again, if you are accused of being a Christian nationalist, it's 99% the case that you are doing something right instead of doing something wrong. Because what that means is that you have convictions that you hold that are informing how you live your life who you vote for, what you buy or don't buy, how you, um, how you spend your time, energy, and money. Like, that's what it means. So if you want to vote for a candidate who um, says, I'm going to stand up for the rights of the unborn, I'm going to, uh, to, to uh, tax married people less so that we can promote this good, which is a common good for human flourishing, so on and so forth, well then, if that gets you labeled a Christian nationalist, then so be it. Come talk to me. I will absolve you. You know, I, I'm not, I will not absolve you of things that are actually sins, right? I will, we, we can forgive you of that. But you can, if someone comes to you, you can come, am I this? You know, I talked about this, and this is just where skin has been thickened over the years. You know, you remember when everything, 
you know, there's, there's been a point in the past 20 years where everyone who was a Christian was a homophobe, everyone was a transphobe, everyone was racist, everyone was misogynist, everyone, all these words getting thrown around. And we were asked as pastors, is this true? Like, I don't know when you, what y'all were going through. You remember when all the, um, am I a racist pastor? Like, am I a homophobe? Am I a transphobe? We were being asked this, and we had to really consider. We had to consider, like, well, do you think that certain races are more of value to God than others? Do you actually think that people who have a sexual orientation in this way should be prosecuted and harmed? Do you think so on and so forth? And if the answer was no, well, then the answer then from us was no. No, you're not. Like, you may have opinions and convictions that put you at odds with the current cultural milieu, but that would be no different than Paul standing up in Athens and saying, this is, um, you are worshiping the unknown God, and this God has been revealed, and those things that you are worshiping are now idols. Like, that got him in just as much trouble. You know, he was called all the things, beaten, thrown, and ultimately killed, right? So, again, I don't want you to... Um, you know, we want you to be like Paul, Peter says, and I attempt this in my own life to varying degrees of success, so far so good, is to, with gentleness and humility, you know, with weeping, um, present your case before the world, you know. I mean, Paul always writes, remember my chains, you know, like this is nothing. Jesus says, judge not, lest ye be judged yourself. That's true. So you better be careful if you're actually levying judgment on someone that you are not liable to the same judgment, right? But if you are liable, like for instance, you commit adultery, right? (laughs) Well, then you know where to come, uh, hat in hand, to confess and be absolved, albeit you may not, you may have some further uh, relational problems after that, but your relationship with God would not no longer be one of them, right? This is what we talk about. The judgment that we talk about is always in service mercifully so, of the healing. You know, good doctors don't go in and say, well, I guess all of your coughs are just because of allergies, right? Never check up the fact that you're, you're hobbled over hacking, right? I mean, that's not what doctors do, and that's not what, but that's what we're being asked to do as preachers. So pray for us, you know, because I would love, listen, I would love to have nothing but happy conversations with people that never sin. That's what I want to do, right? Um, But instead, I have an awful lot of sort of mildly uncomfortable conversations with people who are trying to convince themselves that what they're doing is not actually as harmful as it, it, it is, and lovingly trying to correct that misunderstanding before things get worse. Right, and this is this is like a picture of my my marriage. My, my life. Like that's our conversations all the time, uh, back and forth with me. Um, and I'm grateful for that because we are nothing if not inveterate liars. And the person who's easiest to lie to is yourself. Right? I mean, I had a pastor once tell me he was much older, and he's still alive, but he was he seemed much older than me then. Now he seems like closer to my age. But uh, but it's, it's strange how that happens. But he said, I spend all my time listening to people try to absolve themselves until they finally realize that they're wrong. That's what he said he did. And I said, well, gosh, that sounds a lot like my 20s, you know, <laughs> like the, uh, um, or my early 20s at least. But they, uh, and again, don't hear me saying uh, higher, holier than thou. Um, you know, I have friends and I have pastors in my life that, um, that I talk to. And so this is part of the process, part of the, of the uh, so anyway, I didn't mean to go. So here's, here's something that's interesting. Um, a New Yorker, I don't read this article, I read it for you, and it really sent me into a bad, sort of sad place for about, about two hours. Um, then I had to go for a run or something, I felt better. But um, polyamory, which is otherwise what we simply call fornication. This is what polyamory is. Poly meaning many, amory from amore or amorous or from love. I don't know, what language, I'm sure it's a Latin root. At any rate, um, this is uh, a discussion, and it's a discussion amongst polite people. This is the only point of this. Like, people in, in polite society are talking about their various uh, permutations of their um, sort of intimate gatherings. This is what, um, and this is taking place, like, maybe at cocktail parties you've been to. Maybe you have friends that are involved in this. I mean, it's coming to a, a tennis group near you. It's coming to your golf foursome pretty soon. Um, I know it's hard to believe, but this is where, I mean, again, it, you had, it, I was talking about the people who thought they could tra- transform their bodies into goats, you know, 15 years ago, and everyone laughed then, you know, and now that's, that's I mean, you may have someone in your, in, your, in your family that's transitioning into something. Um, and so at any rate, um, I just wanted to say, uh, this is, um, well, I don't, you didn't even know it. Um, so 2024, 
uh, we are going to be still talking about what happened in 2023 among Anglicans and most notably the GAFCON conference, which I'm grateful that y'all gave me the opportunity and freedom uh, and, and the church mouse helped us go to, uh, to go, uh, which was awesome because it forever altered my, uh, my life. So there we go, just a small conference. But to stand there in Africa and see this, uh, you know, and we're in the extreme minority there as a sort of white Western people, but to see these fellow brothers and sister Anglicans around the world, some of whom are in incredibly dangerous uh, situations like Northern Nigeria, for instance, you may be reading about, um, to see them standing uh, on the authority of scripture against the prevailing winds of culture, which they were calling by name, you know, America, West, we do not want your abortion, you know, on demand. We do not think it's health care. We do not want um, uh, uh, newfound iterations of quote-unquote marriage between various permutations of people. We don't want this. We don't, we would like to stand firm on the word of God. And if you offer, you can offer the world and we will not accept it. It was very powerful to see, particularly for people who, you know, part of our, um, Part of the uh, uh, cost of going was a little bit elevated so that we could subsidize and scholarship some of these bishops and archbishops and clergy who could, you know, who could never afford to, to fly all the way to um, uh, um, where we, Uganda, um, I mean Rwanda, excuse me. And, um, and it was just the most powerful thing. I mean, I'm still thinking about it. But one of the ramifications of it was what we call the Kigali commitment. And in the Kigali commitment, it said that we will no longer pretend that we are in fellowship with heterodox and non-biblically uh, orthodox, quote-unquote, churches. We're not going to pretend that anymore. And that had most notable effect on the Church of England, because the Church of England was on the verge of, which now has, um, committing the same heretical um, uh, error that the Episcopal Church did. Namely, they were going to bless that which God has said is not to be blessed. You know, you can forgive anything, but we can't bless everything. This is the thing. Anything can be forgiven. Anything at all. You know, I mean, that's, and that's a hard thing to say. You know, there's a debate a long time ago about they were listing the worst people in the world and could they be forgiven? And the Christian answer was yes, which was a sort of a shocking, you know, to the non-believing Twitter people are like, see, I told you this is a ridiculous uh, religion. And you say, well, that's sort of the heart of it, is that the, the worst and the least of these, even, even they could come. You know, this is the, um, so anyway, but so the Kigali commitment is going to have further ramifications. We haven't really fully figured it out yet. You know, it's a commitment, and like many commitments, the, the ramifications of it will be um, sort of absorbed and filled out as we walk, right? So we're not really, we're, we're working this out now, but it is being worked out. There were lines drawn in the sand, there were names taken, there were bishops who stood and will be counted. You know, this is why they went there in part. It's like, we have a list of these people. We know who you are. It was filmed. We saw you sign. You know, this is not to frighten you, but it's to encourage you, to galvanize you. Because stranger things have happened. There's when people get in, um, you know, courage when it's tested under fire um, is often fleeting, right? Or can be fleeting. And so we're there behind them saying, we got you. You know, like Moses' arms, you know, you can do this. And so that's what's going to be interesting in 2024, precisely because now not only the, Epis uh, the Church of England, but now the Catholic Church has gone in this direction, which is to, um, is to perpetuate an unholy and destructive lie. This is what they're doing. This is not loving. Come to mere Anglicanism and you will hear the entire conference of mere Anglicanism is how to actually communicate the truth in love right? Because it is not loving. If you have ever had a child or, or a person in your life who is doing something that is contrary to the will of God, explicitly so, and you've seen the destruction that wrought in their lives, or you just know the peril that imperils their soul, then you know that it is the least loving thing in the world to say, well, that, of course, God blesses this. You know, it's just not true. So God no more blesses two men or two women in marriage than he does an adulterous affair between a man and a woman. It's, it's no difference. No difference at all. Then he does outright lying and going down the list of Ten Commandments. You know, this is something that we all have the capability of transgressing. So we are no holier than thou. And yet, we, when we transgress, we are given to repent and be restored, not to be blessed. This is, and this again, we've talked about this. Y'all have walked through this. I've walked through this. The Episcopal people, former Episcopalians have walked through this. But this is a divide that is now going to go to the very heart of Christendom itself. 
Because if this continues to perpetuate within the Catholic Church, then you're going to see, I don't know how it'll look in the ecclesiological system, but, you know, stranger things have happened than, um, than the popes have been turned on by the bishops. And, you know, I mean, you know, read about the Avignon papacy, for instance. I mean, there's, you know, the, 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 the sort of monolithic idea that the Catholic Church runs without these various factions is just a myth um, to the un uninformed. And so there are really interesting things happening as we speak. You know, it was really sad for me. This is a sad turn of events because as much as I protest against the Roman Catholic Church, I definitely appreciated their, their uh, stalwart stance on some of these issues. And so I pray for them now, pray for Cardinal Sarah, pray for Cardinal um, uh, uh, Bishop Barron, pray for Cardinal Chaput, pray for, I mean, these are just the ones I know off the top of my head. I'm sure that there are all over the world, like in the Anglican communion, faithful Roman Catholic bishops, I know even now, um, who are telling their clergy, do not do any such thing, like do not, which is in direct defiance of the Pope, which again is really quite interesting, for historically speaking, because we get to live in, during this time. I mean, it's really very exciting in a certain sense, because what's happening, as I've said before, is we're watching in real lifetime the tsunami uh, that is going through the vineyard that God has ordained to wash away all of the, the plants that have shallow roots that, are, that were not plants in the first place. You know, this is the parable of the sower. You know, some fell on rocky ground, some fell on um, ground, but the roots were too shallow and the sun came and burned it down. Some, the birds came and ate. Well, the sun's shining, the birds are flying, and the, rock, the ground is rocky, and we're finding out whose roots have stayed. And it's blowing through all the denominations. United Methodists, blowing through Southern Baptists, blowing through Presbyterians, blowing through Anglicans, certainly, and now Roman Catholics. So we're going to see. I don't think it's going to settle out immediately next year, but things are moving so much faster than we thought that perhaps this time next year we're starting to talk about, I don't know, um, you know, reunifications, at least in, in, in sort of common cause with people in denominations and places that we never could have imagined. And it's really quite cool, you know? I mean, the days when it was like, I'm a Lutheran, you're a Catholic, you're a Presbyterian, you're a Baptist, and we just walk past each other in our little small towns, you know, like my grandmother grew up with, like, that's over, you know? Now it's like, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible? Are you ready to possibly get thrown in prison, too? Okay, let's, have, let's, go, let's go to Cracker Barrel, you know, or whatever. Let's go to the all-you-can-eat sushi place, you know, before they kick us out because we hold the wrong beliefs, right? Okay, so um, down to, oh, this is Gavin Ashenden, which is pretty funny. Kelly, I have to admit, I mean, there's a little bit of delicious sort of, what we say, irony here, or at least what, what's the, um, it's not um, shot and Freud exactly, but this guy was the, the bishop, Anglican bishop to uh, London, to the, to, the, to the queen, and he, he converted to Roman Catholicism, and I don't know, I mean, I'm sure he doesn't listen to this, but, um, but he converted not just like, yay, I'm a, I'm a Roman Catholic, but he then began telling all of the Anglicans why they should no longer be Anglican, and so it was a little bit like, come on, buddy, like, you can go, we're not going to keep you, but now he left in part because of our heresy on gender and sexuality issues, and now he's really upset, so I don't know, maybe he'll become Eastern Orthodox. Um, so, how do we get here? Well, if you read Carl Truman's book, then you already know. Um, if you haven't, then you might want to consider, but you might also want to consider the shorter of the two, which is called Strange New World, which we have in our bookstore. But if, if, even if you haven't, it's worth, even if you have, it's worth repeating, because this has to be drilled into your head, because this is how we got here. Because the problem that lies within the Christian church, and we're going to talk about non-Christian, but within the Christian church, goes all the way back well, it goes all the way back to, um, well, to the garden. Did God really say? You know, so it's nothing new, right? Uh, but in our sort of modern iteration, in our sort of intellectual world, I'd like to begin with this man named Friedrich Schleiermacher. And Schleiermacher, who wrote this book in the turn of the 19th century, in 1799, called On Religion, the colon of which is Speeches to the Cultured Despisers of Christianity. Like, this is a book. I don't recommend you reading it. It's really dense, and it's, it's, a, it's I mean, it's, it's, it's a classic. It's a classic snapshot of, like, the height of, of kind of post-enlightenment German rationalist Christian thinking. So it's really, it's, I mean, you have to read it uh, if you get a doctorate, but you, but you don't have to. If you don't, you shouldn't. Hey, there's a lot of books like that, Tom, right? There's like, who would ever read this? It's like a, it's like a, per, it's, um, like a military training. Hmm. So, um, like, you shouldn't, anyway. Point of this, what did Schleiermacher try to do? He tried to make Christianity palatable to unbelievers. He tried to explain how it actually wasn't as, um, as sort of mystical and mysterious as it, as it is. 
It actually was more intellectually sophisticated than, than your grandma told you when she said, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible told me so. You know, so he tried to make it so that he could both be an academic. I mean, I went, I got my doctorate from the Schleiermacher School of Theology at the University of Humboldt in Berlin. Like, he was a big brain, you know. This is where um, Heidegger taught. This is where... Um, uh, Einstein, you know, is where this looks a big one. So he was, he was trying to say, look, religion, Christianity is just as intellectually uh, viable as all the, the sort of the other disciplines. And to a certain uh, sense, he's, he's, he's perfectly correct. You know, some of the smartest, most intellectually sophisticated people who've ever lived have been Christians. So it's not, it's a, it's a really, it's a really ignorant, appropriately thing to say that um, Christianity is somehow anti-intellectual. That being said, it is not, it is not um, able to be um, turned into something that can be wholly intellectual because it's spiritual and it's, it's incarnational. It's all the things, right? And so, but he wrote this book, um, on religion that sort of set the tone for two ways of understanding Christianity, either as a sort of argument that needed to be um, sort of sheared of its more fantastic uh, sort of, uh, you know, aspects, um, and then made more palatable, which pushes it down into what? Just a system of ethics, right? Immanuel Kant being the, the king of this. So then it becomes Christianity is good for you because it makes you a better person. And more better, better people make better families, better families make better businesses, better businesses make better towns, better towns make better countries, and that's why it's good, right? Well, that very quickly can become non-Christian, right? And this is what we're actually seeing in our modern sort of quote-unquote conservative discussions today. The non-Christian conservative movement um, is making many similar arguments that Christians would have, um, just not, uh, you know, but then they're making many uh, dissimilar arguments at the same time, right? So... Why do I say all that? Because um, we are, okay, that was the side. Okay, here we get to the Gospel of John. So I know this seems all over the place, but I wanted to just put that into, uh, into a category because what we are talking about when we talk about the incarnation, so we are talking about the answer to um, the, some of the great philosophical questions that have ever been posed, namely, how do we actually know anything at all? I mean, this is the fundamental question, you know, it's the epistemological question, like how, how is it that we're sure, you know, remember Descartes threw a wrench into this when he says, I, I think, therefore I am, but his first one was, I doubt, you know, I doubt, I, I'm, I'm a thinking creature, so, you know, this is, this is, um, so Christianity has always argued that God is distinct from the creation and therefore is an external reference point that then by which we get our bearing, not unlike a, like a, um, what is the old uh, sextants, you know, or like a, uh, my grandfather taught me about the, the triangulation of the old GPSs, remember? Like you had, you had two points, you know, if you had an external point, you could find where you are. With it. Well, the God was always the external referent, right? The Archimedean point, as it were. And so with that referent, you then could begin to make sense of yourself, right? And so he began to say, well, what is this body? Why do I have these desires? Why do I feel these compulsions? Why should I do that and shouldn't I do that? And the answer was always, well, in part, well, God has revealed this to you. This is what the whole Old Testament is about. Was it fully revealed because it, I, Jesus hadn't come yet, but now in the fullness of time when he has come, now it becomes not simply a sort of um, geographically ethnocentric uh, sort of religion, but a universal call to the world to uh, embrace this external referent and therefore find direction and purpose and meaning in your life here. That's, that's the whole point. And what this has been called down through the ages in philosophical terms is called logocentrism. Logos is sort of the, the Greek word for, it's translated in a million different ways, but wisdom, order, being, consciousness, um, it's in the most famously in our way, used by the Apostle John in direct reference to Jesus in Arche ton Logos, in the beginning was the word, the Logos, right? Why is that important for us? It's because we argue that if you do not embrace the Logos, Jesus, well then you will not understand anything else, anything at all. And go back and read some of the, um, the, the sort of uh, so the history of modern science that has rejected God, and you'll see, you'll see how this goes awry very quickly. Um, so I'm not saying you shouldn't trust the science, but I'm saying you should trust and verify, right? So, um, okay, so this goes back, and I'm taking this directly from a book 
right here. And you want to know, I'm just, I'm going ahead like a magician, go ahead and show you the tricks right up front. Like I did not come up with this idea, but a guy named Louis Marcos revealed it to me in a book, uh, this Plato to Postmodernism. It's the best 22 hours you'll spend. Um, other than Philip Carey's um, uh, lecture on Luther and the Reformation. So those are the best 50 hours you'll spend. So go download them right now and put them on one and a quarter and you'll, you'll, you'll get to come teach the class instead of me. <laughs> but, so he points to the idea, the old, old story that, you know, modern philosophers and all their skepticism and what can be real is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. Remember Plato? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. What was Plato? I mean, not Plato, Pilate. What was his response? What is truth? Right? Well, that's no difference than, than people saying, you know, my truth is your truth and your truth is my truth. There's no difference in saying, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, the, the idea that we have, um, that we should go to our basis animalistic instincts uh, because there is no God and just sort of we should do what we want with our bodies, that's nothing new either. You know, that was, I mean, that was where we get the, the term cynicism from, from uh, uh, Diogenes, you know, who, who, to make fun of the idea that we had something good about our bodies, he went around like naked and soiled himself and lived in dog, you know, like dog houses. This was centuries, I mean, millennia ago. So we have the, one of the first recorded instances of a sort of deeply skeptical philo uh, philosopher named Gorgias in one of Plato's dialogues. And according to Gorgias, there are three propositions. Nothing exists. If it exists, it cannot be known. And if it can be known, it cannot be communicated. Now, I want you to see the three big words associated. I know this is heavy going, but I'm just feeling my oats here. So the three big words associated here. If, if nothing exists, that's a question of ontology, right? It cannot be known, that's a question of epistemology. And it cannot be communicated, that would be a question of linguistics or speech, right? Now that's, those are important concepts because those are the ones that have been under assault for the past two centuries in our Western world, which is why we are where we are, okay? This began back with what's called The Masters of Suspicion. This is just a book. I have not read this book, but it happened to have these three um, fun funny looking pictures of them. Forbach, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, and Derrida. We're going to put these guys very quickly. Forbach said famously that all theology is anthropology. So what that means in his way of thinking is that we just think of the biggest, most powerful thing we can. We call it God. We worship it, and we hope that he re rewards our effort, right? That's what he said. Well, he's wrong, but at any rate, he found out now. Um, then we have Marx, you know, famously denied God, materialist existence, said that we are economic beings, you know, that we, are, we have sort of, that we are driven in by these cycles of, of economic, you know, power, and that's now been transferred not simply in economic means, but in power and victimhood, and that's what we're hearing now, right? That's what Marx, uh, you know, Nietzsche, famously aping Schopenhauer, by the way, just simply said, will to power, like whoever has the most guns is the one who makes the laws, and the laws will tell you what to do, and if you don't, they'll shoot you. Right? I mean, that's Nietzsche. And then um, Freud said, not so fast that you think you know what your motivations are. You know, you've got some sort of inner demons in there that, uh, you know, that we need to lay you on a couch and talk about ad nauseum. And they have something to do with your overbearing mother and your distant father. Right? And so that's what Freud did. So all of this came in, not, and I would argue, not necessarily, I want to be very careful in about putting a giant asterisk, not necessarily all bad not necessarily all bad, because some of the suspicion we should have about ourselves comes directly from the scriptures. You know, as Paul say, the very, what, what, I do not understand my own actions. The very thing I do, I, I, I hate, and I see within myself a, a law, a wrestling, you know, he's in Romans 7. Now, that's not entirely Freudian, although Hannah Arendt said that it was one of the most the um, clearest examples of the divine inspiration of scripture because nobody in the ancient world would have considered talking about themselves like that unless they had been given something from above, right? That's an aside. And then finally, um, this all came together in the 60s and 70s, not only but primarily through a man named Jacques Derrida, a French deconstructionist, who put it all together and basically used that to, um, to entice um, uh, people to, to uh, well, usually it just all ends up in some sort of debaucherous fornication, you know, like, like Foucault. Like, I got a lot of big words, and the more I say, eventually I'm going to get you back into my bedroom. Like, that's the whole, the whole point of a lot of this philosophy. Um, so, I thought that was funny, uh, but there we go. I thought that was, that was a pretty funny... Um, so, um, so, we have what's called the deconstruction. Um, sort of, there's a new word for it, Kelly was telling me, but I, I don't know what it is. 
uh, the pre-modern world, because God put it there and that's the way it always has been, the modern onward and upwards with inevitable progress, and then the post-modern world. I thought that was pretty funny. Like, this is where we are now. Um, I just thought that was a little funny. So like I told you, this is from... Um, so, okay, so I talked about ontology, epistemology, and linguistics. We're going to talk a lot about epistemology over the next couple... I had in my old church, two before, we had an epistemology symposium, and, and we had this wonderful woman named Esther Meek come and speak, and it was all about, and there was like six people that showed up. And so I was like, note to self, call it something else, <laughs> or, or do some real heavy advance work beforehand, because like, that just didn't, remember it went over, I mean, we had a fun time hanging out with Esther, she was great, but, um, but, but I want to talk to you about epistemology, because epistemology is from episteme, like with the knowledge, how do we know, like how do you know, for instance, I talked about this a lot back when they talked about um, fake news. Well, how do you know? Like, how do you know? What is your process for going through vetting a news source? You know, and you can't just say, well, it's one of the major three anymore. Like, you might have been forgiven even 10 years ago, and I would have probably listened to you 10 years ago, but you can't just... So what is your, what is your process by which you disseminate information, and why? And so, not only why, but, but how? Well, this is all part of a very important discussion. And so, you know, Mike Johnson, uh, for instance, got in trouble when he was interviewed, and he says, you want to know my worldview, just go pick up a Bible. I'm like, well, that at least gives me some indication, which was very, you know, which was negative to some, but I'm like, well, okay, well, there's where he starts, you know, so I might, I might like that or not like it, but either way, I know something. But what if you don't have a Bible? What do you have, you know? You have, like, what, the Huffington Post? You have CNN, you have Fox News, you have Epoch News. Kelly tells me the Epoch News is funded by the Chinese for misinformation. I didn't know that, so I'm, um, I don't know, I trust you in that, so I stopped, I stopped listening to it. But at any rate, so ontology, who are you as a person? What does your body actually mean, or does it mean anything? Is it something that you can just translate into whatever you want, or is it something meaningful? Do you have inherent worth? This is what ontology, what does it mean to be something, right? Well, how do you know? How do you know what it means to be something? And finally, how do you communicate that to the world? You know, are you, um, are you, and this is why at the heart of Gorgias's propositions, thousands of years ago in the mouth, from the mouth of Plato, we see the persistent argument from unbelief, which is that we are, make ourselves, we don't really know what is true, and therefore whatever we say is just sort of um, meaningful to me, but not necessarily to you. That was not a modern idea. That is the perennial anti-Christian idea. Did God really say? And if he didn't say, well then all, you know, we'll, he says, then there's a the million different possibilities, right? But if he has said, well then there's only one. Well, the incarnation means that he said he has spoken and there is only one. It's called the scandal of particularity, right? It's a big stumbling block for people all throughout history. How can this one person's birth and life and death in Palestine um, so many years ago affect every human that has ever lived before and after? How could that be? It's like, well, we're not really sure. <laughs> we thought a lot about it, but that it is is what we profess. Right? That it happened in time and space. I mean, the, the, the apostles had no more, um, you know, right at the beginning, um, sort of, they didn't have like a second textbook to help them figure this out. They started preaching it, and they started watching what came about of it, and they started watching people's lives transformed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and began to realize that the presence of this very God who they saw ascend into heaven was with them, and innervating, I'm mean, sorry, it, um, it, uh, energizing and, and directing them, and they begin to write and preach and teach and develop what we now, we still live in, is the church. Okay, why do I say all that? We've got five minutes left, we're going to do it. The Apostle John, right? The Apostle John is a man of his time. Uh, they were not all ignorant, illiterate fishermen. I mean, they were fishermen, but they were not, there's a lot, a lot of history about this. But suffice it to say, um, his gospel, the last of the four written, and, um, not within what's called the synoptics, which is the first three, seen together, soon optic. Uh, but the third, uh, fourth gospel of John is, is decidedly different in that it was uh, more of a theological reflection on the, the meaning of the incarnation and Jesus' life and death, right? That's how you can kind of understand it. So, so it's, it's beautiful. But he would have been conversant in um, the 
the philosophy of the day. And if you don't believe me, go back and read Dermot McCulloch's History of Christianity, colon, the first 3,000 years, which is a provocative title because Jesus obviously um, came 2,000 years ago. And he argues there, as I've said before, that the Hellenistic sort of um, intellectual world um, was, that's within which where a lot of sort of Jewish um, reflection sort of was mixed up in there, right? Uh, which is by God's design. Um, so, when John starts talking about the word Jesus, what does he pull? He pulls from the Logos concept, which was very much a part of sort of Hellenistic, uh, Aristotelian, and um, uh, Platonic uh, philosophy, right? But he does something very distinct to it. He uses, this is Louis Marcos' argument, but I really like it. And I preached about this last year. I'm sure you all remember and took notes. But, um, but he says that in the prologue to John, he is addressing, through Jesus, those three great complaints. That there nothing exists. If something exists, we can't know it. And if we did know it, we couldn't communicate it. Ontology, epistemology, and linguistics, right? He's arguing that John knew this. Because Check this out. The prologue to John's Gospel may be read as a succinct refutation of Gorgias and Derrida's propositions. In answer to the proposition one, we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, there certainly is something, Mr. Derrida and uh, Mr. Gorgias, you know, um, uh, <laughs> anyway, I had a joke, but anyway. Um, um, there is something, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In contrast to proposition two, we have and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And we have beheld His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. So not only do we know that something exists, we know what exists. That we know that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It wasn't just a concept, but a person. And we have beheld this glory. So we have, not only is there something, but there's something that we know. And finally, that no one has ever seen God, the only Son who's in the bosom of the Father, but He has made Him known. So not only is there something, but it can be known and has been communicated in the person of Jesus. And in that communication, we have all of the fullness of God dwelling in Him, but also the opening of the um, otherwise mysterious darkness of our lives. That's what the sermons would be about. If you already heard it, you can hear some, it's all part of the soup. But see, this is the significance of the Incarnation. When people want to turn Christianity into another set of sort of uh, like a morality tale, you know, it's heartbreaking. Because I want people to be good, you know, like you. I want them to, be, to not lie, cheat, or steal, you know. And, and thankfully, a lot of people we hang out with don't seem to be inveterate lying, liars, cheaters, and, and thieves, you know. I mean, that's, I mean, although, if you know someone, welcome to church. We can, we can talk to them. But, but the significance of the Incarnation has ramifications for everything, every aspect of our lives, how we know what we know, how we understand who we are, how we even understand what we're communicating to people. And if we lose that, well, then we lose something of, of singing the hymns about Christmas. We lose something of, the, of, the, of the celebrating the Lord's Supper. You know, we talk about, um, about him becoming, uh, his presence being real with us in the bread and wine, just as it was on the road to Emmaus when he opened the scriptures. Remember the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus? They said, remember when he opened the scriptures and broke the bread uh, that, that, that our hearts burned within us? Well, this is what we do each and every week, each and every, twice a week if you come on Wednesdays, unless Patrick's right now can only do morning prayer, but stay tuned. So anyway, this is my, my, this is the reflection I wanted you to have, is that when we consider Christmas, when we consider um, the incarnation, we're talking about an overhaul and an overthrow of all of our otherwise misguided understandings about who we are and who God is. And what that begins to do over time is emanate and permeate every aspect of our lives. And then we become people who genuinely know who we are as those in need and worship in spirit and truth the God who has made himself known in his son for us. Okay, well, I'm going to leave you with that. So let's uh, pray, and then we'll get uh, back in church. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone, that we who walk in darkness have seen a great light, and that we, um, we know you because you have made yourself known to us. Lord, we pray that this truth would, would always be a cause for, um, for prayer and worship of you. Lord, we pray that we would never take for granted any aspects of uh, the mystery and the majesty of who you are and what you've done to save. 
And Lord, we pray that as this truth deepens in our hearts, that we would grow in our confidence to speak something of you to our family and friends, to our neighbors, Lord, as we um, know that by the power of your Spirit and as you are lifted up, you will draw all men unto yourself. And that is a promise and a hope upon which we stand. And in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll see you next week, or unless we see you in a minute, but I'll, I'll be back next week. So, same time. <laughs>